On September 25, 1969, an eight-year-old girl named Tally Shapiro was walking to school along Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood when a car pulled up beside her. Tally told him she wasn't allowed to talk to strangers, but the man said that he knew her parents, so Tally got into the car and drove off. An eyewitness saw Tally get into what appeared to be a stranger's vehicle. The car was able to be located outside of a local apartment building, and inside they found Tally sexually assaulted and beaten with a pole. Police were able to name their perpetrator Rodney Akala by his personal possessions in the apartment, but Rodney was able to flee the scene before the police arrived. Rodney was 28 years old at the time and was a student at the UCLA School of Fine Arts. He was able to stay under the radar even though he was on the FBI's most wanted list and moved to New York City. He enrolled at an NYU film school using the name John Berger where he studied under Roman Polanski for a brief period. In 1971, he got a counseling job at a New Hampshire children's camp using the same alias just spelled different, this time John Berger. Two children from the camp he worked at recognized a picture of Rodney from the FBI's most wanted poster in a post office. They were able to arrest Rodney at this point and take him back to California for sentencing. At the trial for his crimes against Tally Shapiro, her parents did not allow her to testify and the entire family had moved to Mexico. With no one to testify against him on the rape and attempted murder charges, he was convicted of child molestation and sentenced to three years in prison. He was paroled in 1974, and in just two months after his release, he was again arrested for assaulting a 13-year-old girl whom he lured into his car for a ride to school. He was again released after serving two years. After he was released from prison in 1977, Rodney was allowed to travel to NYC because his parole officer was being lenient on him. While he was in New York, Rodney killed 23-year-old Ellen Jane Hoover. Her remains were found buried on the Rockefeller estate. Shortly after his New York City trip, he returned to Los Angeles and worked for the LA Times as a typesetter. At one point, he was investigated by one of his co-workers because they believed he was a hillside strangler, but he was relieved of these charges and he was arrested and retained for a short time due to possession of marijuana. While he was working at the newspaper, he started posing as a professional photographer. He would show off the pictures to his co-workers. In most of the photos, the girls and the boys he photographed were naked and often in sexual poses. Most of the people he photographed were never identified. Many investigators believe that they could have been victims as well. In 1979, while Rodney was photographing a 15-year-old girl named Monique Hoyt, he knocked her unconscious and sexually assaulted her. Monique was able to get away from Rodney. What happens next in this case is incredibly frustrating and it goes to show that Rodney continually flew under the radar and was basically able to do whatever he wanted. I'm going to audition each of you for my private class. Bachelor number one. And you're a dirty old man. Take it. Come on, over here. <laughs> <laughs> Tennis. Thank you. Rodney, thank you. Okay. You can go relax, meet each other, say hello, get acquainted, and they'll be back. And before we begin our next game, let's find out what runners-up will receive today from Johnny Jacobs. So Rodney not only appeared, but won the dating game TV show in 1979. The woman who picked Rodney for a date was Cheryl Bradshaw. She refused to go on a date with Rodney after the fact because she found him creepy. After this, Rodney killed at least three other women. Investigators believe that the rejection could have been an exacerbating factor as he did not handle rejection well. On June 20th, 1979, a 12-year-old girl named Robin Sanso was walking from the beach to her ballet class and Rodney approached her and asked to take pictures of her. Robin's body was found 12 days later on the foothills of Los Angeles. The police were able to track down Rodney because her friends were able to give an accurate description of him to a police sketch artist. And from this sketch, Rodney's parole officer recognized him immediately and turned him in. 
police found a receipt for a rental locker located in Seattle while conducting a search inside of his mother's home. Inside the storage locker was Robin's earrings and hundreds of photographs. Rodney was arrested in July of 1979 and held without bail, but he was tried and given the death penalty for Robin's murder, but it was overturned by the California Supreme Court because the jury was not informed of his prior sex crimes. He was tried again in 1986 for Robin's murder as well as his previous crimes. He was again convicted and sentenced to death. This conviction was nullified by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. In 2003, Rodney would have a third trial, but this time the investigators were able to link him with several other murders on top of Robin's and his previous sex crimes. In 1977, he murdered Jill Barcombe, who was 18 and living in New York. She was found rolled up in the Los Angeles ravine in 1977. Georgia Wickstead, who was 27 at the time of her death, was bludgeoned in her Malibu apartment in 1977. Charlotte Lamb was 31 and she was sexually assaulted, strangled, and left in her laundry room of an El Sanguido apartment complex in 1978. And Jill Partineau was 21 and was killed in her Burbank apartment in 1979. Rodney also kept a pair of Charlotte's earrings in his Seattle storage locker. While he was incarcerated waiting for his third trial, he wrote a book called You the Jury and filed two incidents against the California State Prisons for a slip and fall incident as well as their refusal to provide him with a low fat diet. The 2003 trial was very frustrating for the jury because Rodney decided to represent himself. So he would ask questions as his representative or lawyer, if you will, in a deep toned voice and refer to himself as Mr. Alcala. And then he would answer his question. So this was very frustrating and also rather confusing for the jury to follow. So this case was just completely a mess all around. His main argument against the Robin Samso murder was he could not have killed her because he was trying to get a job at Knott's Berry Farm at the time she was kidnapped. He also said that the earrings that were found in his storage locker belonged to him. He claimed he wore them when he was on the dating game and played his episode for the jury to watch. Rodney made no major attempts to dispute the other murders besides that he did not remember killing them. Tally Shapiro, Rodney's first victim, testified against him. This helped sway the jury even more to convict him on all five counts of first degree murder. Rodney was sentenced to death for the third time. In March of 2010, 120 of Rodney's photographs were released to the public. 900 of them were not able to be released though due to the graphic nature of the photos. There were about 21 women who came forward and were able to identify themselves from these pictures and six families identified family members who disappeared and were never found. In June 2012, Rodney was extradited to New York where he would stand trial for the murder of Cornelia Crilly and Ellen Hoover, both whom he murdered in the 70s. At first he pleaded not guilty, but in December he changed his mind and pled guilty for both murders. On January 7, 2013, Rodney was given an additional 25 years on his sentence as the death penalty was not an option in that state. In March 2011, Rodney was labeled as a person of interest in the unsolved murder of Antoinette Whitaker, who was 13 years old in July 1977, and Joyce Gaunt, who was 17 in February 1978. Rodney kept jewelry belonging to both victims in his storage locker. In March 2011, investigators for the Marin County Police Department announced that they were confident Rodney was responsible for the 19-year-old Pamela Jean Lamson in 1977. Pamela was at the Fisherman's Wharf to meet a man to photograph her. Her body was found beaten and naked near a hiking trail. There were no fingerprints or DNA evidence, so no charges were ever filed, but the police believed they had sufficient evidence to convict Rodney of the murder. Lastly, in September 2016, Rodney was charged with the murder of 28-year-old Christine Ruther Horton. She disappeared in 1977, and in 2013, a relative recognized Christine in one of the photos made public. Christine's body was found in Sweetwater County, Wyoming in 1982, but was not identified until 2016 when DNA was matched with tissue samples from her remains. 
Rodney admitted to taking photos of Christine, but denied killing her. She was six months pregnant at the time of her death, and Rodney would not stand trial for this in Wyoming because he was too ill at this time. There are several other cold cases in which investigators believe Rodney is the perpetrator. These states include California, New York, New Hampshire, and Arizona. Rodney died on July 24th in 2021 at the age of 77 of natural causes. This case is absolutely terrifying to me because Rodney went under the radar for so long and was able to travel from state to state and be arrested several times before he was convicted of murder. And he was clearly very dangerous, so it really makes me worry that there are other killers out there or that there were other killers that have never been caught who were able to travel around and didn't have a specific MO and were able to just continually get away with these murders. And that makes me think a lot also of Israel Keys, who had a similar type of situation. Of course, his was a little bit different, but he was able to cross state lines and go on airplanes and, you know, just travel all over the United States and potentially other countries and murder. And neither one of them had a specific MO, a specific person they went after, or a certain age or anything like that. Although Rodney did mostly kill women, he did only kill women but he didn't have like a specific age rage. He killed a 12 year old girl and then like a 31 year old woman. So he didn't have anyone very specific he went after. I'm assuming he did have clearly something against women, but he would go after any age range. It didn't matter to him. But it really is terrifying that Rodney was on TV and even just seeing his performance, it's most likely because we know what he did, why it seems so off-putting, but his answers to everything are just so, like, incredibly awkward. So let me know what you guys think of this case. I thought it was really interesting, but again, very terrifying just to know that we don't always see in serial killers that they have a very specific MO, that they always go after the same type of person, that they always kill them in a very similar manner. It's very easy to see now that many killers probably didn't have an MO and there are some killers that we have no idea that all of these murders are connected to the same person simply because of the way they dispose of the bodies or kill the people. It's probably completely different every time. So that's actually really horrifying and scary to think about. Uh, so I try not to think about that type of stuff all the time, right? Uh, but if you guys have any other recommendations for cases, please let me know in the comments. And if you like shorter format true crime videos, please check me out on TikTok. I'll put my name on the screen somewhere around here and I'll put it in the description. So if you like shorter videos as well, I do post there as well. So otherwise guys, I hope you stay safe out there and I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.